in what is being hailed as the most significant water-related Supreme Court decision in a generation. The U.S. Supreme Court ruling in Sackett versus the Environmental Protection Agency earlier this year has captured widespread attention. To understand the implications of this ruling, we are joined by local Maynard Nexon attorney, Mary Shade. Mary, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So this case started 15 years ago. Can you give us a background on, on the Sackett versus the EPA case? The Sacketts purchased a lot near a lake mm -hmm. and intended, I guess, to build a, a house. Yeah. And in commencing construction, they backfilled the lot, which means they put dirt, moved dirt in to raise the elevation of the lot. You can backfill for a lot of reasons. It's not necessarily because you have wetlands, but just because you need better soils to support construction. But the assumption in this case was that perhaps they backfilled to fill uh, low elevation areas with wetland vegetation and that they destroyed wetlands in the process. So the EPA went after them and the case wound on for years mm -hmm. through various courts and eventually ended up in the Supreme Court. I think with the Sacketts taking the position throughout that this wasn't a water of the United States that they filled, it wasn't a jurisdictional wetland, that the Corps of Engineers and EPA didn't have any jurisdiction through the Clean Water Act mm -hmm. over this area. And ultimately they were successful and they prevailed uh, with the United States Supreme Court decision. And the court took that opportunity to create a new test for what is wetlands because there have been a series of cases going on for 15 or 20 years trying and through those cases it was all about adjacent wetlands and isolated wetlands mm -hmm. and whether or not those were waters of the United States and the court had through those years articulated various tests and then the EPA and the United States Army Corps of Engineers had taken those tests and devised guidance and devised rules and had possibly exceeded what the court had attended, intended in those tests. And you, you said five very important words, waters of the United States, and that has changed in meaning. Right. Can you explain the, the significance of, of that? Well, the Clean Water Act um, regulates discharges into navigable waters. Navigable waters was then defined as waters of the United States to include wetlands, mm -hmm. okay? So there's wetlands and then there's, there's jurisdictional wetlands and then there's other wetland areas and the whole issue has been about whether these other wetland areas were also waters of the United States. Okay, and so now, so this was a unanimous ruling by the court and it cut into the EPA's authority much deeper. So now the water of the United States, a wetland to be considered protected has to be connected to a larger body of water. Is that, is that? Right, not? if you don't mind, I, I don't wanna mess it up. So I'm gonna read the test <laughs> that go was ahead. established by the court. An assertion of jurisdiction over adjacent wetlands um, which would be different from wetlands that are clearly jurisdictional, requires that the adjacent wetland be a relatively permanent body of water connected to a traditional navigable water and that it has a continuous surface connection with that water, making it difficult to determine where the water ends and the wetland begins. So, so this is a very clear articulation of what is and is not a water of the United States that kind of addresses years of confusion. Now, Mary, when you say wetland, some people may think of a swamp. Why do we care about, about wetlands? Wetlands, um, well, first of all, we live in the coastal plain of the state of South Carolina, which actually extends to Columbia, mm -hmm. okay? And we have a, a great deal of wetlands in the coastal plain. Um, if you look at a map that different resource agencies have created, we almost have as many wetlands, it appears, as we have uplands. So uh, wetlands are very e uh, ecologically significant. Mm -hmm. uh, tidal salt marsh, for example, that's a wetland. Tidal salt marsh, um, which will always be a water of the United States under the Clean Water Act because tidal waters are always considered navigable waters. Tidal salt marsh provides tremendous habitat, um, uh, nursery areas for wildlife. It's a buffer for rising sea level and tides, a buffer to upland areas. And, and I'm just scratching the surface. Very ecologically significant, as are freshwater wetlands. Freshwater wetlands also carry 
tremendous ecological significance. Mm -hmm. um, they provide habitat for, um, you know, important wildlife that without the wetlands, we, you know, when you lose habitat, you start to lose wildlife. Mm -hmm. Uh, they provide some flood control and some and some buffer to flooding. They absorb waters, mm -hmm. so you know nobody would deny the significance of wetlands. Mm -hmm. What the issue has been is the extension of the authority of the Clean Water Act to areas, wetland areas that are isolated, lacking a connection, not flowing into any water body. That's been, that's been the issue. So for people that live on the coast like us, how is this going to directly affect us? Well, for people that live on the coast, um, there's a lot of um, back and forth between environmental advocacy groups and communities and people that want to develop on the coast. And um, d development will often require n obtaining a permit from the United States Army Corps of Engineers to fill wetland areas. For the development community on the coast, this provides a much clearer bright line test and it makes it, uh, um, makes it easier for them to predict whether or not they're going to get permits, whether or not they're going to be able to use certain acres on their property. Mm -hmm. For the community, you know, you, you have a vested interest in protecting the ecological significance in this community, all members of it do, you know, of, of the beautiful area that we live in. But that needs to be balanced, I think, with the economic and social interest of building homes. You know, we've, we've been very lucky in that we've attracted all this wonderful industry to this area, which brings jobs to so many people coming into this area. Well, they need places to live. Yeah. So we've got to build homes. We've got to build hospitals. We've got to build schools. And we are a very wet state. Mm -hmm. So you've got to balance both those issues. Yeah. Well, I'm sure this is going to be a continuous conversation. This just got passed two months ago, I believe. So we hope to have you back in, in a few months and we can see the what, what has came of this. Mary, thank you so much yes, for joining us thank today. thank you. We're back in two minutes.